HiSec buyback offers 90% GDA anywhere in HiSec. Simply go to HiSec.EveBuyback.com, appraise your items, create a contract, and get paid quickly. Hey everyone, welcome back. I'm Rain. You are joined by me and not my cat who has just abandoned me. But I'm joined with Artemis, our engineer, Araya, Gerg, and Shen, and we're here to talk to you about FanFest and our thoughts on it. I'm going to kick the intros over to both Araya and Gerg, who we may have seen on the show before, may not have. So I'm going to let Araya kick us off with a short intro and the overall positive or negative feeling from FanFest, just at a high level. Thank you, Rain. Hey, hello, everyone. My name is Araya. I am a director here at TIS, managing uh, community affairs. I'm also an executor in TNT, a member of the Imperium for over a decade. As my feelings about FanFest, I'm cautiously optimistic. I, I, like the, I like the direction they're going in, but I, I like to see them deliver on the content they presented. All right, thank you. And Gerg? Hi, I'm Gerg. I used to be around here more often with the weekday show. I am a member of Pandemic Legion. For, for the past six months and have been in this coalition for the past two years out of the three that I played the game. I mostly do PvP and some medium-scale industry, and I am cautiously optimistic about the FanFest stuff. Alrighty. Well, I'll ask Shen, who folks have seen here before. Shen, what are your um, feelings about FanFest? Overall, Aria and Gerg said, I think uh, cautiously optimistic, <laughs> but I feel like without all the buildup that maybe CCP had given us before FanFest, this would be a really good one. But given all those changes for the past three years and those price increase and everything, I think it just levels things off to like a, a medium uh, level. Yeah. Alrighty. So not too positive, not too negative, but cautiously optimistic. And then Artemis, our engineer, what about you? What are your feelings I on FanFest? I am throwing caution to the wind. I am purely optimistic here. And we're going to have a discussion about why that is a little bit later on in the show. But I am Artemis. I'm the CEO of Talking in Stations. Also do some stuff on Declarations of War, although not as much anymore. And I'm a member of Brave Empire. So I am literally drinking out of a Brave coffee mug right now. So overall, you guys have been mostly more positive than negative. I'm. I'm kind of the same. I like the phrase cautiously optimistic where you have hope, but you're not going to get too hyped about it. That's how I was going into FanFest, and that's how I feel coming out. I like a lot of what they said, but until I actually see it in the game, I'm not going to get my hopes up. But with that, we're actually going to get into it. FanFest Day 1. So FanFest was this last week. For those who don't know, FanFest is the annual, ideally annual meetup um, in Reykjavik, Iceland, which is where CCP headquarters is located every year for, I would say, like, the past, gosh, like 20 years, excluding COVID, CCP has rounded up folks in Iceland to go usually to like some convention center, hit the bars nearby, have a big party and showcase a lot of new uh, and up and coming content for EVE Online. This year was no different. They had a big keynote longer than normal in the past. They had round tables, they had player presenters. Usually it's been three days. This time it was only two, but they still had the party at the top of the world live streamed as well so for those who missed it you can go check out the twitch.tv slash ccp channel and check the video on demand if you want to see their past broadcasts and so artemis right now is showing some of the content so this looks like to be the keynote it's either the keynote or the faction warfare update with ccp aurora which i believe we've heard a lot from ash Dorothy claiming that it was coming that he was confident there was a faction warfare rework and this is what we're actually seeing now i am I'll start off with saying I'm a huge Faction Warfare nerd, maybe not into the um, the fighting for a side, but I lived in Faction Warfare space for at least three years. I have a lot of assets there. I'm in an alliance that like thrived in Faction Warfare space. So I'm excited for it. However, Aurora mentioned they're in the planning phase, going into the designing phase. So none of this is currently into the game yet. So that is where I am very, very cautious. Hi, Ash. How are you? Yeah, so I don't know if anyone else in the panel had thoughts on Faction Warfare. I'm not sure. I know a lot of Nulls like Wormhole population, but I'm not sure if you guys had any thoughts on Faction Warfare. Oh, yeah. I I have... I'm a really big fan of Losec. 
when I first enjoy, learned to enjoy the game, I was living in Eve University's LOSEC operation, which uh, closed down a, a month or two ago. And then, and I was just mostly just roaming around Placid and Black Rise. And then when I was initially joining Pandemic Horde, I was part of Waffles and we st still, traditionally a low sec focused corporation st still until the big war and delve started were mostly out in that area and i've always been a big fan of low sec not necessarily because of its specific game mechanics but because of how densely packed the pe the people are so even if the fights aren't as big there are more people around to fight more, more small groups to fight with i mean can we do just a quick check around the table here who all started like their pvp exploration in faction warfare low sec whether you were in faction warfare or just there running the plexes because they were a great entry point i know that's how i learned the pvp ray what about you you know i started in null sec i actually went to null sec within my first few weeks but I was actually very active in faction warfare during the tier five abuse era. So back in that day, you know, everyone, you know, had a Titan, there were space coffins. So what else did you do with that account is you would spin up a faction warfare alt and go to faction warfare and abuse the tier system. I'm oh, sorry, go ahead, Ray. No, I was similar to Array. I feel like me and my friends joined and we all went into null sec. And then it was like, oh, wait, Faction Warfare is actually pretty cool. So we went to Faction Warfare space. And that's where I learned how to solo PvP. I never picked a side. I never did missions. But the plexes were prime for me learning how to fight and being able to like limit those engagements way better than I did ever could in Nullsec. And then Shen? Yeah, for me, I actually have never touched uh, Faction Warfare. Like, if you look at all my characters' activity tracker, Faction Warfare is level 1 or level 0 for all of them. But I do have core mates who, uh, like I said, do abuse uh, right now, even to nowadays, the, uh, the tier systems. They do run a lot of missions. I know it's a lot of work, but it's very, very rewarding. So that's the idea that I've been hearing for a long time. It's just that I got into Nosek almost right away. I got introduced to the game by a friend who I used to live in Nalsec, and that's how I started, and that's how I uh, grew up as an EVE player. I mean, Faction Warfare, through this revamp, it seems very more active and very exciting, so maybe uh, in the future I will check it out. Yeah, and speaking of checking it out as a Nullsec player, so in the past, Faction Warfare, or I guess not in the past, as it currently stands, if you want to join into Faction Warfare, you yourself either have to leave your Corp or Alliance, or your Corp or Alliance has to declare a side. And the one of the goals for Faction Warfare, you can see up there with Aurora talking, is about allegiances. So rather than say, okay, Rain Chocolate and Habit and Pandemic Legion, either you you have to leave your corp or to join, or like your whole corp and alliance have to join. It's me personally can determine my standings and go and actually pledge an allegiance to a side. And there's some still work in there. They said like if I'm too negative to like if my standings are too negative, maybe they reject me. But for now, that's the current goal is to try and get it so players can participate no matter where they are in the game or who they're with in the game. And I really, really like that because that's been one of the biggest things with Faction Warfare is people say, well, I want to try it, but I need an alt in order to do it because I don't want to do it on my main. But then my alt doesn't have enough ships, so you're super limited. I agree. I, this is this is probably the best feature change for Faction Warfare. I'm already seeing people ask questions in the Imperium. Are we going to all go into on one faction or is it a free-for-all? Because the logistics of it now, I can't take my alliance, my corporation into Faction Warfare because you have to play with your standings and kick people who don't have the right standings. This is an amazing change if they implement it. Yeah, for sure. Oh, what were you saying? There's there's also going to be a lot of drama coming out of it. I anticipate. Dunk said during his his interview, like the his HR people were just going crazy about having one member of their corporation on one side, then another member on the other side, and then they run into each other in faction warfare space. And what do they do? Like it's gonna it's gonna cause some drama for sure. Hey Rain, would I be allowed to shoot you? Would would I have your permission to do that if we were on opposite sides in faction I warfare? Honestly, I would say yes. So the way I see this is, so think of like 
the proving grounds, right? The proving grounds, you enter as a ship and you have to fight your opponents. As far as I know, every alliance and corp ever is like, you know what? If you're killing your allies in the proving grounds, it's free for all. It's the proving grounds. Like that is your choice. You go in there, you might have to shoot blues and it's up to you to live or die. And so I would say the same thing should be the same for faction warfare. Like if you are not in like your soft space and you know, you're not deliberately like using blue Intel to go out and murder your friends. Like if they're in a plex and you want to capture, or defend that plex, you go in and you fight them i i think it's totally fair game and i think people who have to face that drama just kick the people causing the drama like they're obviously not worth it so like that's that's i'm all for it and like i would love to see sides like that i know a lot of the faction warfare folks are role players and it's totally a role play thing like yeah you have your alliance back in null sec but this is low sec and low sec different rules so i i'm excited for that yeah i to answer your question gagarin absolutely you you, you could do alliance on alliance combat the only question is how much srp you're going to get so if your alliance is not giving you srp you might want to find a alliance with deeper pockets yeah, yeah. hang my on first it, it, like my thoughts immediately go to because uh, i had friends who like i said you still doing missions in a lot of those faction warfare spaces they invited me actually a few times to do missions because it's so profitable but the problem i ran into a lot of times is if i move show my like active high skill point character to that space that means i lose them for any ops or any cdas in nosec so yeah you have to make a choice and now i don't have to make a choice so it's the simplest things that i can do is just go up there and make a jump clone i can do whatever i want in both spaces uh, and then it's much more content especially uh, like i play in the time where my mainly my alliance is in alliance so it's off time zone so a lot of times i can get get content that way instead of uh, falling out of the tops. Yeah, that's a good thought too. You just play it at a different time than your friends, ideally. Chat's talking about, so we talked about allegiances. Is there anything else anyone wanted to add with allegiances? I'm excited for it. I'm super stoked. I yeah, think the only I, point, go ahead, Gregor. I'm also really excited for allegiances because well, I've never been in a militia since because I've always been in corporations that were not aligned with faction warfare, but I want to try it in some way. Yeah, for sure. What were you going to say, Artemis? I'm super glad Araya brought up SRP because if like any of the big nullsec blocks or even just some of the major alliances are willing to commit to a given side and say like, hey, we're going to SRP your, your fleets for going and participating in one of these faction warfare things like that has the potential to swing the war zone pretty heavily it does yeah and another thing too is so speaking of fleets and srp if you get lp from these factions you can actually use that as srp too so like if you're flying navy or faction ships you can just use that to srp which i think would be smart like if you're capturing systems and whatnot but speaking of swinging war zone systems i know chat's talking about it too the other big topic was borders I mean, I think they're called like what, like frontline, oh yeah, dynamic frontlines. They had like a it's fancy one, name, frontline badline. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So one more other point on the allegiances. It also right now, if you want to do faction warfare and you're in a group like Gagor and I, we can't do faction warfare on our main characters. It's impossible. We would have to spin up an alt. And let's address the elephant in the room. Subscription prices are going up this month. This allegiance systems alleviates that. You don't need to spin up an alt in this system to participate in faction warfare. And I think that's an amazing positive. That's yeah, another good point too. Yeah, also just a point I was raised is like, if let's a big alliance go full in to commit to help uh, one of the factions, the LP of that faction may crash right down because I mean, it's related with all of those missions, with all those operations you do within those spaces and let's say one side like it's, it's, it's similar to the tier system that we have nowadays where if one side winning too much that per lp ratio of that faction is going to go down dramatically yeah that's a good point too that's been i think one of the bigger concerns at least one of my concerns with faction warfare now is there's like no incentive to join the other side you join the winning side farm that lp and then you wait until the side switch and then you can cash out that lp so i'm hopeful i know i don't think ccp addressed that in any other talks maybe they did at the round table but i'm hopeful that they address it but the other thing too is like oh I mean, I think Aurora said it in the second day during like her own panel time for the half hour. She said like she's gonna 
they're looking at issues where players like NoSec players, she uh, specifically said, like that are profiting of those low sec missions, and they're looking to change that in some ways. So maybe that's like have a higher LP ratio for those for faction or for factional warfare corp or some sort of things that's going to help them to make more profit because nowadays like even you write those complexes what from what i heard is much more profitable to run to just run a round of faction warfare missions to earn actually isk yeah ccp aurora explicitly said that they are going to be removing and replacing the tier system and then they're also going to be removing the necessity to run missions and like get the tags for you to cash out your loyalty points. Oh, well, that's really good to hear. I'm glad to hear. That. Speaking of like running missions, we were kind of hitting at the frontline system. So rather than so right now with faction warfare, so it's like an entire war zone within low sec. Not all of low sec, but some of low sec. And a lot of what people run into is that instead of actively fighting within faction warfare they'll find a back-end system where nobody else is really around there's not a lot of traffic and then they just slowly capture plexes there complexes so they'll go in shoot the rat capture the site and just do that over and over and then if somebody comes to chase them they just leave and that's how a lot of people get lp in faction warfare now too especially with alts you can kind of do it afk some people accuse people of botting in that manner but um that's another thing that CCP is going to address. They're going to use front lines where rather than trying to go all the way in the back line, if you're doing that, it's going to take way more time and way more effort. And instead, your resources are better spent on the front line where two bordering hostile systems. So you have Mimitar on one side, Amar on the other. And then those two systems, you want to be doing offensive and defensive plays. And that's kind of where I'm thinking it will be really helpful if you're a NullSec alliance and you want to help turn the tide in some way, shape, or form. You at least know where to go and where to attack. And then at the same time, if you're sitting there trying to think, wow, how can I best use my efforts? Maybe that's um, like a key area rather than you know going to some place where there's no activity just so you can sit in peace and capture systems. I know. Ar I Ar like, I yeah, I like that they tied both the military um, defense capability in this model and the PVE model. So if you're in a backline system, to take a backline system will be harder. So it's a lot easier to take a frontline system to push that war zone forward. But also if you're doing activities to make you make income, you make more income in the dangerous frontline systems than you would in the backline systems. And that's also really interesting because it pushes players, whether they want to make ISK or kill, kill each other, to the frontline systems. And I don't think they said this at FanFest because I, I listened to the FanFest recordings. I also, there was an interview with CCP Dragon by Ashtarothi. I'm going to link this in chat. If you have not listened to this, this is a really great interview. Ashtarothi starts relatively with softball questions and he gets progressively more difficult in his questions. It's a really good interview. And one of the things that was talked about was the possibility that if this system is successful in faction warfare, we might see this in other systems such as SAV. And that's interesting because I don't think many people in NullSec like the BRM system, to be honest, and a, a new SAV system, even the thought of it is exciting. Oh yeah. I definitely know how the problems of the BRM stuff. I was back in Delve, whenever they wanted Intosis people, I was one of the first people to volunteer every time. So I've done my share of that kind of stuff. For the new players who might not be familiar or even just Faction Warfare and high sec players, what's the BRM system and a quick overview of like why people don't like it? So BRM stands for Bounty Risk Modifier. And so the concept is so with rats, rats, when you kill a rat, you get a bounty. So a lot of people in NullSec will get is by killing rats, just called ratting. You warp to a site, an anomaly, you shoot the rats, and then every 20 minutes you get a tick of a payout. The bounty risk modifier assumes the normal default rate is 100%, and the more you rat without any conflict, conflict or dying ships, the lower it goes. So therefore, if you're ratting in complete safety, you get less payout over time. Whereas vice versa, if you are PVPing and there's a lot of ships dying, the bounty risk modifier goes up, saying, hey, this place is riskier, therefore if you rat, you have the potential to earn more ISK. A lot of players don't like it because it really doesn't work as intended. Like the thought would be, oh, if you should go and fight people because they're ratting in the system so we can go and fight them and gank them and change the bounty risk modifier. And in reality, is it just doesn't work. 
people will rat in a high in the high area and then as it gets lower and lower they leave and then over time it goes back to 100 percent, and then they go back again and just continue to rat and so it's it sounds cool in theory in practice it does not work i mean there was that fantastic data presentation there were quite a few amazing graphs if you go through and watch the recordings but where they looked at how the distribution of ratting income changed since the BRM and the DBS system came in place. DBS is dynamic bounty system. It's sort of the overarching system for the BRM. And they, they looked at, and I think the stat that stuck out to me the most, I'll have to try and find the graphs once I'm done talking here, is that previously it would take 72% of solve systems to account for 50% of the income because people were so concentrated. But now that's down to like 50% of the solve systems account for 50% of the income. It's much more widely distributed. Obviously, there are still those peak systems which are getting huge amounts of ratting done regardless of their BRM. But overall, things are much more spread out throughout the universe. And deep null sec systems aren't as heavily farmed as they used to. To be honest, like one well, for some of the systems I've seen with higher multi uh, bounty multipliers will be at least right now between fire and imperium. Uh, so whenever we go from our space in Curious to let's say fight a battle in those what we, when they call the floodplains in Fetabalas or in uh, Terminator Rifus, th those spaces have huge, huge. Uh, bounty multipliers but the problem is it's sort of no man's land like there are space in between coalitions like those where floodplains has to be established nobody want to fight in their homeland so it kind of works in the opposite way of what ccp is intending which is the, the safe system that people do rat in is really really safe but it, there are skir skirmishes like normal stuff but not like full on full on battle but those places with full on like hack on hack battles those places are more than likely it's going to be like uh flood planes and nobody really lives in those places i think part of the um, issue some pay players have with the brm is it, it also doesn't respond very well it goes down very quickly and in ccp Bertotti's presentation on saturday he said that was intentional coming out of the shortage phase is that they wanted to not bring ratting income back up to where it was previously. So it is a little bit of a harsher system if you want to make ISK. And also campers are not entirely gone either. <laughs> I will say that. Oh uh, yeah, campers. Cloaky yeah. campers, you mean? Yeah, cloaky campers. At least we know that Frat at least have campers in our space. The difference between now and back in the days is they do lock off after somewhere around midnight in in China time, but they do go back up in early in the morning. So for for EU and uh, US players, they, they do get a window of ratting because you you, they, you can have the opportunity to put down the mobile observatories and actually scan them down when they're when the person is sleeping. But during those active time zones, there's still a high chance of uh, getting kept in in like your own even your home space. I mean, if they're active enough to avoid getting caught, it sounds less like cloaky camping and more just like active hunter. So what they do is they put eyes in every system, every system. They get some sort of a bot from what I'm hearing, and then they get alert saying this system with this account you have has a mobile observatory, mobile observatory down in the system, and you just safe lock that account. You just do that every time. Because I mean, a person is is all that like 70, 60 campers all co controlled by one person, so that person can't be awake for 24 hours. So there must be a window of time where he sleeps. And that's a time where we can come out safely to rat to mine and all that stuff. And I remember, I think I was actually on the show, somebody a few weeks ago shared a video of how one person actually caught cloaky camping bots. Like now it wasn't a person, it was a literal bot because they like did all this testing and stuff to to like demonstrate that it was a bot or whatever but yeah it's still i want to say it's still an issue i never will mind active players camping but yeah when you start throwing in botting or afk stuff it's not fun for the game and it's not good for the game but uh, 
Yeah, so the BRM system, ideally, I mean, if this faction warfare stuff goes well, ideally, we can start seeing maybe some of that in Nullsec. I know there's been a lot of complaints about solve warfare in Nullsec, but I also don't know how much I liked the old solve warfare either. So ideally, we find something that is like this happy medium that makes everyone, you know, it's, I don't know if fair is the right word, but it's reasonable and achievable to try and both defend and attack. Yeah. And even if this, if this becomes a new SOP system, even if it's not something that's better than our current system, I, I know a lot of people would wait for details to comment on it. It's different. It allows us to figure it out. And I think after many years of having the same system, in a lot of ways, our current system is Dominion R2, really. A new system would be nice to figure out and play with. I think the last thing I do want to mention is CCP, and I'll, I'll bring up something Ashtarothi said in the chat as well, which is that the allegiances expand or extend beyond just faction warfare. They also extend to high sec. They also extend to the arcs and the story that we're going to be talking about a little bit later. And CCP intend to use that as sort of a, a guideline for newer players as they're exiting their career agents, as they're exiting the NPE. Hopefully these allegiances will direct them into faction warfare to get them integrated into PvP or into other corporations, which I'm super excited for. Yeah, hopefully we see that expand. I know there was also the comment of allegiances applying to f pirate factions too. So rather than just fighting for empires, instead you can actually fight for pirates which would be really cool. Players have been asking for that for a long time. Prince of Venal in chat also points out that these are just ideas, which he is correct. The faction warfare changes are also in the exploration phase, as Aurora calls it. They are. She's going into the design phase. She mentioned this week. So her presentation said next week, which would in theory be this week, ideally. So for those who have feedback or have thoughts, feel free to share them with CCP. They've given a lot of information, and I know this is like my cautiously optimistic part where until it's in the game, I don't believe it's actually going to happen, but hopefully they are fielding tons and tons of feedback from players. So if you're a faction warfare pilot, or you play in that space in any way, shape, or form, share your, share your thoughts with CCP. They don't have to be the end-all, be-all solutions, but saying they're giving an idea of like what you find difficult or what you would like to see is super critical for them right now, especially as they're fielding, field, fielding feedback from multiple sources. Oh my god. Okay, I am taking this opportunity to stand on my soapbox and talk about all this bitter vet nonsense about I don't believe it until it's in the game and where's my Lodgy on Kill Mail. Like, we have had the structure updates that were promised, we've had the iteration that was promised, we had the reversal of shortage phase, the iteration on DBS metrics, the iteration on ship balance, like, in this particular case, they even went so far as to give us a timeline and say, hey, by the time we hit the 20th birthday, like, this is the stuff that is going to be completed. So yes, things are in development phases right now. This is a preview. This is them saying, hey, this is what you have to look forward to, not this is what's coming tomorrow. The stuff that's coming tomorrow is the stuff they didn't talk about. There's a quote, and I want to get it exactly from CCP Loki, so I'll pick it up here in a second, where they're like, there is upcoming features, there's upcoming new toys and changes that they explicitly didn't talk about because they want it to be released and discovered through the story arcs, through the lore, through the RP. But, like, hold your salt when you're complaining about this stuff hasn't hit TQ, so I'm not going to believe it. That is the most absurd, like, pessimistic view I can imagine. It is very pessimistic. I, I, think, it's, I think it's balance, right? There are people that are excited, there are people that are not excited, and I allow people to have both opinions. There was a question about what CCP is doing the last two years, and it was explained on a CCP Dragon interview. They updated a lot of things in the back end. They made improvements to the tools so that they can update the game systems faster. So if they want to go back and redo missions, which is one of the things they're doing, it takes a lot less dev time now than it did two or three years ago. Now, that's very exciting for a developer, and I understand how developers are excited about it. Players, not so much. I mean, that's like, that's like I got a new iPhone, and it's a great OS updates, but there's no new features. Okay. So I, I can understand some of that pessimism there. And when we look at, not balance, but you look at new features, we did get structures, but we didn't get them in the time expected. So the promise of replacing POS with structures, with upwell structures, very, very great fan fest, very well received, five years, and we still only got 
not even 80% of what was promised. Still love it. I mean, so some people don't like structures, but it, it, took a, it took a long time. And I think that's where some people are remembering. CSP will give us feedback about things they're going to do. And sometimes we'll get it and sometimes we're, we don't. I'm still holding out for Angel Titans. I probably will until I die. I'll never see them. Uh, I, so gotta, I, I can give people. I can give people that. You know, if some people are, say, "Hey, you know, I'm cautious here. I, I, I like what I see, but I, I'm just. I'm not going to be super excited about it until I see it. I give it that. I give that to them. I got to push back on that one. Like, what? What do you mean we're still missing twenty percent? We even got the the observatories for the stopping the cloaky camping. We've got the flex it's not structure entirely. <laughs> we got. We still have passcode in the game, and they said citadels will replace passes over five years ago. And if we sell passcodes, that means so. Okay, I feel like there's a whole lot of cynicism in this room. You're saying this the <laughs> features aren't in the game when they are in the game, just because there's still older stuff that we don't want to get rid of yet, and they they're still committed to continuing to iterate and improve on it. But that doesn't mean there isn't stuff in the game right now that is really freaking good. Well, they do have a lot from the from the uphill structures, but it took five years. It didn't take one year. It didn't take six months. It took five years. It, it also took the entirety. Like I was gonna say it took the entirety of CSM screaming at CCP for them to make a change a year or two within. Otherwise, we would still all be flying materials against void bombs, and like that was like a huge issue with citadels. And everyone was like, "Change this, change this, change this." CCP was like, "No, we'll iterate on it later." And they're like, "No, you need to change it now. It is destroying the game." And they finally did. So it was nice, but we shouldn't have to harp on CCP to get that. Like I love iteration and I love when they iterate. We just need to keep seeing it. And so that is why it's like cautiously optimistic. It looks great as a plan, but until it's in the game, it's going to be like Lodge on Kill Mills to me. Just a promise set at a fan fest that I've never seen. Incursions was my other example. We had incursions. I love incursions the day they came out. Sancha incursions would be the first faction to do incursions. Today, how many factions have incursions? Two. We got trigs that have incursions now. Yay. I guess three if you include. No, I don't know if Eden Com counts. I mean, you do see those Diamond Rats, Grista, or Blood Raiders in your space that kills your miners. But yeah. That That is good, though. Like the Diamond Rats, like upgrading the AI, that's good. I wish CCP would, like, mm, they might have said this and I missed it. But like describing all the different types of rats and like current state where they want to go to with rats, like that would be good. Like, so, like something like that, like something where like we as players, like we can't see everything they're doing. So them just telling us to say like, hey, here's what we're doing. Like see the CCP Dragon interview. Like if they were like, hey, these past two years we did all this stuff. I'm like, cool. Totally get that. I think one year they were like, yeah, we're helping with the China Serenity update. And I'm like, okay, that's fine. Like you can spend your dev time there. At least I know what they're doing instead of thinking they're like twiddling their thumbs. That's, that's my only thought with a lot of this. Like it looks really good, but a lot of the bitter vets are still going to be – new players are probably super optimistic – and then you have like Artemis, I think, is the exception. But everyone else is going to be like, okay, it looks cool, but until it's in the game, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm glad you brought up Triglavians as a fantastic example of my point. They did not sit the players down in a dev blog or in a fan fest keynote or anything and say, hey, here's what the invasions are going to do. We're going to create this new region called Potfen. We're going to have these invasion sites. No, it was, it was all discovered through lore, through RP. And they have explicitly stated that's the model they're wanting to follow. I, I pulled up the quote from CCP Loki. They said, we're holding back a lot of content during this keynote. We want all the toys, etc., etc., to feed out throughout the arc into your hands. And the sites are on TQ right now to discover information about the upcoming features that are going to be discovered through this arc. So, like, they have explicitly stated they aren't going to be going through the same process of, hey, these are the changes that are coming that you may have experienced in the past. You need to get used to the new normal of the way invasions rolled out. And I personally think invasions was a massive success. Oh, yeah, the original, the invasion stuff, that was great. I tried running the sites when they originally came out and when they were originally just invading random constellations, kind of like incursions, and then when they added the Stellar Observatory sites, that was my main source of income for a few months. And then after they started sucking systems into Pachvin, I didn't really do much with them for a while, but they've 
consistently done some great stuff with the Treglavians. Yeah. And I think the reason we're caught... Go ahead, Sean. Sorry. uh, One thing I do miss with those uh, Treglavian invasions is like something to do with battleships in high sec, some high-end stuff. Nowadays, especially with the biz, it's more like cruiser and the only thing I guess you can do right now is either the incursions or some level four missions. I would really love to see like some sort of new sites coming back that really requires battleships to do. One of the reasons I'm also optimistic is before the pandemic, they had 80 individuals working on EVE Online. That's now a number of 150. That's almost double. They did give us some stats in the keynote or maybe an opening ceremony where they said 63 percent of eve developers this is their first fan fest and i went back and did the, the math and the calculations their turnover rate was in the last three years has only been about 30 percent, and that's not not too bad so they have this larger pool of talent working on eve online now that wasn't working on it three years ago and i think that's also very positive positive. and they also yeah. mentioned bringing existing talent who have been previously working on completely revamping the NPE, building entirely new backend systems that they can use to push that content. Now that those systems are mostly in place, they're moving them off and into the the living universe sort of development cycle and part of the development for EVE Online. So I, I think things are going to accelerate in terms of content that we're receiving. Yeah, no, that's that's good news, too. I know a lot of players, I feel like a lot of bitter vets, and I'll key phrase bitter vets is the, is the key part there, are super upset about hearing about the MPE. I know for me, I'm, I don't know, I'm half bitter vet, half not, but I've been hearing about a new MPE for over five years, so it seems like one of those like rehash things. But I'm glad they're finally to the point where they have something set up and then at least set up in a way where they can iterate on it with fewer devs or at least add to it with fewer devs. And so that's really exciting to me because that sounds like they're going to stick. They have one that they like and they're going to stick to it, hopefully. I'm watching your, the way you, you flip through some of these slides. I know we talked a lot about faction warfare. We talked a bit about, I would say, a roadmap. This is something we haven't seen in a while, but like a year roadmap. I'm actually really excited about that. I know... CCP hates releasing roadmaps because you're going to get people like me who are going to hold them to it. So if we don't have Faction Warfare in a year and, what is it, four months, September 2023, I'm going to hold them to that and be really salty about it. But this is good. Like, at least we now, we as players, like, now know where, like, what's coming, when to expect it in terms. So it says 20th birthday. So EVE Online's 20th birthday is, what was it, May 2023? However, FanFest is in September 2023, so I would kind of give the more conservative approach of September 2023 when looking at these timelines. Yeah, I agree with that. I was actually surprised it was pushed down to September for FanFest because that's awfully close to eVegas. Yeah, we got lucky, though. They announced it ahead of time so folks can plan. But I make so this is Artemis's point of pointing out there's gaps. So that I'm assuming those big blocks in there are either story related or potentially like hidden content that we don't know yet. But it's it is exciting to see, you know, what what they are looking for. So you have I always I always call like some of the stuff's like more technical. It's like the DX12, the the Photon UI. But then you see like faction warfare. I see more structures. Allegiance systems. So if you look, the Allegiance system is completely separate from Faction Warfare. They show the NPE at the top. So some of this stuff I think is really, really good to say, okay, you know, they talked about all of this. I'm the pessimist. I don't trust them unless it's in, you know, actually in the game. But in the, a year from now, I should be able to see at least most of this. And CCP did say Q4 2022, I believe, was like their aim for a lot of this. The first expansion will be Q4, where we'll start to see this. Yeah, okay. Yeah, Artemis, how do you feel seeing the the keynote? I know know you're very optimistic. I am incredibly optimistic. And I I also just want to bring up again, there is stuff hitting the game right now. We had patch notes come out. There are new content sites that you can go and participate in and discover, discover, like bits and pieces about even more upcoming content like new ships or changes to existing ships that sort of thing it's happening it is in the game they just didn't lay it all out lay it all out for you yet 
which I'm happy for. I do want to highlight this slide here, which is less of the timeline, but more on overall, what are the features you can expect? What are the things CCP is pitching as worth the $20 subscription fee? Because that's been coming up a lot in the chat. And for the record, if you're going month to month and actually paying that full, that full amount, what do you do it? Anyway, this is sort of the overlay of what you can look forward to, what their goals are, and the, the big features that are coming. And this is a lot of big features coming down the pipeline, most of which we haven't even touched on yet. Yeah, I do like how you called out the uh, the paying for your sub. Chat is asking, if you look, it says multi-account benefits. So if there's something, I know they hit it in a slide somewhere, tiered benefits, something like that, totally worth it, in my opinion. Somebody who has like 20 accounts, I feel like that's worth it. If you have struggled to, play, to pay $15, or not, not struggle to pay $15, but if you struggle to pay $20 over 15 maybe Eve's not for you. There's a lot of free games, but... Inflation's going up. CCP hasn't changed the price since 2016. And then it's each individual's choice. So nobody here can tell you whether it's worth it to pay the game, to pay for the game. That's up to you individually, whether it's you can afford it or you actually are having fun. And if you're not having fun, I say this real talk, it is okay to take a break from EVE Online. The game is 20 years old. There's no issue with saying, you know what? I'm looking forward to faction warfare changes, but I'm going to sub for six months until I see something in game. That is perfectly okay. There's nothing wrong with that. We're all humans. You don't dedicate your life to a game. It's okay. And don't forget about the perfectly valid option to just plex your accounts. Back in college, I didn't pay for Eve. I couldn't afford to. I just had plenty of free time to play the game and then buy plex. I feel that's a good point about the um, taking a break until the expansion. A lot of games have expansions. This is exactly what people do. Just before an expansion, the months leading up to it, they just don't play or they... If it's subscription based, they don't subscribe. And then expansion comes back and you get a surge of players coming back to check it out. That's normal in games. And since Eve is moving to a, a expansion model, it's okay to do that. If you say, you know, I'm not really having fun right now, I'll come back and check out the game in a couple months. That's fine. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I'm looking at this list. Sorry, my cat distracted me. And then somebody in chat said they need to be spoon fed and it made me laugh. If you're one of those people who needs to be spoon fed, you got to find a group that will spoon feed you. That's probably the best part about Eve is the social part of the game. We also, I don't know if you guys know his chat, we lost Gurg. Gurg is coming back. Do not worry. He is okay. But yes. So we haven't touched on a lot of these. We talked on Faction Warfare. We haven't... Do you guys want to talk about organizational income? I feel like Araya might be key to talk about this. You know, I like I like seeing that slide. So they did predict they were going to increase or, or make multiple areas of income. So right now, if I have members that are ratting, that hits the wallet and form a tax. And as an alliance leader, I can tax my corporations based on our writing tax. It's really easy. I can tax industry jobs and things they do inside structures really easily. PI tax, really easy. Mining gets a little more laborious. I have to look at a ledger and want to track people down. I don't do that. That's way too much work for me. But if you do Abyssal or you do L, um, Faction Warfare and you're getting LP, uh, there's no tax system for that unless you dig through APIs and try to manually tax people. And again, that's too much work. So what they propose is a comprehensive tax system where you would get tax from all these sources. And to me, as someone who likes tax, because it funds things like structures and SRP and things of that nature. To me, I like these these changes that they proposed. Yeah, I think it's good too because I I mean we're I feel like everyone here is in a larger group except maybe Artemis, but for most players, like they're in small groups and they don't have the I don't know like the resources to de to dedicate to either. One, having a bunch of people rat to make the income that it takes to support a, like a corporate alliance. Or two, they don't have like just the people and the skills like, you know, like an IT team or an HR team or anything like that. Like they're just a bunch of nerds want to play a game. And when they ask to pitch in for, you know, a structure so that they can mine out in high sec, it's a lot more complicated than you would think. And so the fact that CCP is adding something in the game that will actually be able to allow users to you know, find, or I guess, corp or alliance leadership to be able to find individuals and tax them easily, like whether it's, hey, give us some of your mining yield or, you know, whatever it may be is super helpful. Like this, 
I feel like this, it does help the big guys, but I feel like this helps the little guys more. Like it's more beneficial for the little people because the big guys can do this already. It just takes more manual effort. And to, to throw my little touch of salt into this, into this stream, it is more necessary than ever now with the most recent structure changes under Siege Green, meaning that if you want to be a structure-owning group, you have to have effectively a four Azar. So it is, it is now even more, there's a higher bar to meet in order to be, like, dip your toe into the, the PvP waters, into low sec, into null sec, and not just get instantly kicked out. So this is more necessary than ever. Yeah, I like talking about wormholers about getting kicked out. Yeah, that Artemis is a wormholer, and so they're pretty salty I, I was. about the changes. Shortly after the last episode, when I complained about getting evicted from my wormhole because I couldn't log in every day, guess what happened? I couldn't log in every day, and I got evicted from my wormholes. Oh no! So, but this is something where now your group. Or you and as an individual, you know, I guess maybe not as an individual, but if you have a group, you can tax them in some way, shape, or form. So when you go and live in that wormhole, instead of just ratting, you can actually tax blue loot or whatever it may be and, you know, actually see some income from that and then be able to own that Fortizar or whatever Citadel uh, structure you'd One thing, though, about taxing LP, I feel this is a way for groups to start with some Navy faction doctrines. Some common ones that we've seen is TFIs. I know Frat has a Drake Navy issue as one of their doctrines. Maybe more of them can be discovered, right? I know Enid has APOC Navy as one of their doctrines as well. So maybe the more we go with LPs, the easier for those alliances to actually be able to provide those ships to their mem members. So maybe we're going to see that as part of the faction warfare update as well. So taxing LP can be beneficial to, in that sense. Yeah, that's a really good thought. Having this new income tax, I, don't, I guess tax is the right word for all of it, right? But having the new income tax come out at the same time as a faction warfare revamp, like that would be perfect for all groups, right? Like, or I guess not all groups, but for groups looking to actually be able to make money in some way, shape or form. I, I'm just really curious. So like, I'm looking at how some of this looks and I'm really curious to see like how they're going to tax everything. Because I some of it seems like way over my head. Like, I don't know how you would do a mining tax and but I'm really curious to see what CCP can come off with. Well, I think the way they described it is it's going to be sort of built off of the back of the way they're doing the interbus credits, which we haven't even touched on yet. And it's another huge feature where yeah, interbus yeah. credits are going to be pay or play to earn. So based on the activity you have in the game, you're going to earn them. I'm assuming they're going to be utilizing some of the tech for the activity tracker there. And off the back of that is where they're going to have the, the inroads to begin to track activity and income so that it can be taxed. Yeah. And that's both passive and active. So if you're an alpha, you will gain interbus credits or IBC. If you're an omega, you'll get at a faster rate as well as activities. Yeah, the interbus credits, yeah, so only acquired through gameplay, and I think that's what they're using. Yeah, the Corp and Alliance logos on ships and structures, which, by the way, CCP announced it. I tweeted a meme tweet about it with the 19th anniversary, because the Roman numerals are XIX, so Legion of Death. But CCP is actually going to come out with that, so really, really exciting there. But this was their way to do it, so they kind of showcased some new variety of like skins or features on ships. I think they called them like additions or like like things that you add to your ship. Extensions. And so different ways to like bling up your ship. If you're one of those people who play zoomed in and the whole new, a whole new credit system. So then that way, ideally you're not having to like RMT or do anything shady like that, but then you can get it while actually being like playing. Yeah. Those structure, uh, like align skins looks really good. <laughs> Been waiting for that yeah. for a long time. <laughs> Well, I'm excited thing, too. Yeah, go on, well, go on. Thing, as a, I was gonna like myself like a logistic director in my corp. One thing that I think I can think about with IBC is let's say if I had to move this PI from one place to another, let's say from our like our staging to our manufacturing system, maybe I can give my corp mates some tasks to do and then reward them with some IBCs. Uh, that'll be very beneficial for both uh, the person and me, right? It, give me less work to do, but it's, it's also give them a way to earn some sort of IBC and to, to give them kind of skins 
that they want. Yeah, that'd be really cool to like exchange it in some way, shape, or form. That's not like that has like an in-game benefit, like for doing a task rather than just like monetary trading sort of thing. Yeah, and I think they talked about like players setting objective for let's say each other and for themselves. Yeah. So maybe this is a way. But another thing is if you're just using it on Elt, you can like do that over and over again. Like then what's the how do you stop that type of thing? Yeah, I see what you're saying. Like, how do you game the system or not game the yeah, system? To well, be fair and also not being like, you think just you're out to cheat it away through. Because yeah. they're not transferable or sellable in any way, they, you can't buy them for ISK, you can't transfer them for Plex or anything like that. I, I don't think a, a farmable system is a particular issue. Like, if you're willing to spend the time mm -hmm. and the effort to farm up IBC, go for it. No, no, I mean, let's say I've... I have access to the core IBC wallet, right? And then and, and I set, a, set a, a task for my L to say, move this thing from this station to that station back and forth. Every time I give the system 1,000 IBC, I can just do that over and over again, right? Cool. Yeah, they said the IBC can go from players to corp, but not from corp to players. Yeah. Oh, okay. So if you have access to the corp uh, IBC wallet or some sort of access to that, then it's a pretty easy way to earn that. Well, no, you couldn't give it down to an individual player. No, you player. can donate. You donate. Your, so as a player, you're earning IBC, and then you can donate or send it to the corporation. So corporation has IBC, but you, then you can't send that out of the corp. That's the way I understood it. Mm -hmm. So it only sort of cycles up. I'm a bit confused. I hope, I'm wondering if anybody has further information on like what the corp would use their IBC for. But CCP was explicit on you can only transfer upward. So you wouldn't be able to farm on an alt to then give to your main, as an example. So, and this also solves the um, issue with selling ships for real money. Uh, a while back, CCP had this retriever pack that had a, a lot of backlash, and CCP Swift posted on the forum that they were going to go back, think of a of an alternative system, and present something at FanFest. This is part of what they presented: that you can sell ships, or not just the ships but the actual industry jobs to create the ships and get IBC for them. And that would provide those ships to CCP so they can turn around and potentially sell them in those packs. Yeah, it allows CCP to make money but not impact the, the sandbox, hopefully. Or at least negatively impact the sandbox, I should say, because everything impacts the sandbox. That's interesting, though. I think, so the question of what would a corp use the IBCs for, the one thing I can think of is skins, like structure skins or alliance skins. Or I wonder if the corp would say, yes, we want our logo on these ships in this color scheme, and then like they pay credits for it, and then they can distribute the skins to the players, or vice versa, the players can say, oh, yeah, I'm in this corp, so therefore I get this at a discount or something along those lines. Or statues on your keepster. Yeah, stuff like that would be super cool. Or okay. medals, like MVP medals. Like Shen yeah. gets the MVP award for yeah. my corporation. We have these awards we can give out as corporation CEOs, but it'd be really nice to give it in a skin form they can put on his ships. Well, yeah, there's like also top the killer. question of where the IBC is going to generate, right? Like ISK, they generate from ratting. Then there's also a question like if it's traded just between corporations and players, there must be a way to generate it out of nowhere. Otherwise, if there's, if there's nothing in the system, then exchange system won't start. So the, the quote from CCP Rotondi, thank you to Matterall for, for doing a transcript of all these, is every character can generate interbus credits through select activities engagement made for players. So in addition to like activities, we also have up on screen what Array was mentioning, which is the made for players by players. This is the part where you can build or just buy off the market and then transfer to CCP in exchange for IBCs, different assets that then they give out to new players through the NPE or sell in their packs, that sort of thing. So it is absolutely something where you can, you can get your IBC, that's not a problem. I... From what I understand, CCP's whole intention with this is to untether it from any given market and make it so that your heraldry that you gain through your IBC or through getting kill marks on your ships to get those extensions is all going to be based on the work that you do. And then transferring upward to your corporate alliance is how you get, as Astroth, you mentioned, the structure skins or the statues for your corporation-owned assets. Because those are owned by your corp, not by an individual person. So yep. that's like I, 
I am personally looking at this system and the way that they are designing it, and I am very happy. I don't see very many ways for this to be abused. I just see positives here. Yeah, this was something. One note, though, don't put a structure in your medium. Don't put a, a, a statue in your medium structure. You only have one timer, Artemis. Yeah. Especially when you wormhole. Yeah. Don't remind me. Yeah, it's it's exciting. I was I think this was something I wasn't really expecting at all from FanFest, and I'm really excited to see it and see like what it can come from it. Of course, skins. I love skins so. Especially lion skins and those uh, and at least those ser serpentus skins on those vexers. It looks super 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 good. Not gonna lie, those yeah. extensions especially. I think those also relate to kill marks as well. So there has to be some sort of work that you have to be done with those things. I know, let's say it's things like uh, Vexer or Sir or Muning, those things can be lost during a fight right away. But if you think about things like a, a Super Carrier or Titans, those things rarely get killed. I wouldn't say rarely get killed, but relatively compared to like a hack, they don't get killed as often. And then they, some, some of them has a lot of kill marks. Maybe that way we can see a lot of cool Super Carriers uh, or Titans. Okay. Um all I'm hearing is that Logi don't get any extensions because they don't get kill marks, so... I mean, it seems like that way. I mean, you, you do have drones, so there's, there's a possibility, just harder. I think I've gotten, like, two kill marks, or kill mails from the Logi ship. Like, where I was the final blow, I guess. Oh, sorry, what were you saying, Artemis? Oh, there, there are so many things I want to say. Ashtarothy up in chat being like, Snake Cat beats out cat ears. No! This is the perfect opportunity to give my ship cat ears. Give them to me, CCP please. Also, CCP please, put the heraldry on kill mails. I, it's, heraldry is going to be part of the ship fitting. It should also be part of kill mails, so I can see how many kill marks this elite solo pvp -er had when I dunked them. You're telling me you want to kill someone, and on their kill mail, you want, want to display your ship with cat ears? Well, yes, but also I want to see what heraldry they had on their ship. So, like, right now, if I kill a rifter that had a thousand kill marks, there's no way for me to know. I probably didn't even notice while we were fighting. But they announced, like, increased heraldry extensions based on the number of kill marks you have on your ship. I would love to also see that on kill mails. Just a separate section of the kill mail for the heraldry the ship had equipped. I'll plus one that, but only if Lajiang are on the kill mail too. But that's I mean, ex I guess, uh, yeah. I, I guess that's a fa fax pilot. I I do feel that that way, but I don't use my fax that often. So, yeah. Yeah, it'd be fun. I know. Does anyone else have any comments on heraldry or IBCs? Well, I, I think they said this. They haven't give a timeline explicitly for the IPC, but it's part of their plan. So as people don't need to be like very like eager about it right, right away, this is going to be a long time to come. Okay, yeah. Because then I kind of want to transition to, and I've been looking at this because I've been begging CCP for this for a while, but as they're changing things about ships, they're also changing things about player characters. One of the big ones is the removal of character attributes, which have always been confusing to players or like new players since like since new players have started playing the game a lot. Like I would bet even some veterans don't even know what character attributes are. So those, gosh, I remember this back in like, gosh, what, 2014, each skill you have has a primary attribute and a secondary. And based on your character's attribute is how fast or slow you train of that specific skill. So in order to min-max skill training, some people would remap their character attributes, pack their skill queue, and then let it run for a year before they got like a new remap. To a new player coming in, you see that and you have no idea what it means because you're like, oh, charisma. I know what that means, like if you've ever played any other MMO. But then you're like, what is perception? I don't know what the frick that means. Like intelligence kind of makes sense. But some of the other ones just made no sense and players like had no idea what they did, didn't really make that connection to the skill plans or the skill or like specific individual skills, and therefore they were never taught. One thing though, like it says right there, learning implants revamp. I'm really interested in how that's going to turn out to be because right now a lot of people I think uh, have let's say plus five in their heads or in their pilots' heads, and of course that does give you a lot of advantage over people who who doesn't and. 
it, it's it's a price you have to pay for faster speed for more skill points accumulated over time. If attributes are removed, we don't know how that's going to turn out. But I do like the idea of just basically unallocated skill points over time. Why? One example that I've thought about is, let's say for this period of time where I've completed all the hack skills that I need for, let's say, my Nelson character, maybe I, I don't need to train any other skills. I can just accumulate the free skill point until a new doctrine is, is put out. And I can put all my skill points to that doctrine and then I can get on it right away. So instead of waiting for people to train up a new doctrine, you can just kind of uh, alliance and put out doctrine and expect it to be done in less than a week. Yeah, that's the other big thing. So I know Eve Echoes already has this, and I love that about Eve Echoes. So I'm excited for this, and it's not really new, but it helps people who, because I know CCP has to spend time on these tickets where you have an you have an alt sub, you forgot to start the queue or something like that, or like maybe you extracted with an injector or something like that, or with an extract skill extractor. So you extract it, and then you forgot to restart it, and then you have to file a ticket, and the GM has to take time and do some math to figure out how much skill points you need. And it's just like a huge hassle for everyone involved. So instead, this just accumulates skill points. It goes to your pool. If you need it, great. If you don't, you can save it for later. And that's actually amazing, because people do that already with the free SP. They'll just collect it on their character sheets. My main has 2 million SP just sitting there waiting whenever I need. I think you all put way too much faith in the ability of players to not just instantly put their points into whatever they want the most. Like, yes, I have been getting a consistent trickle of SP from the daily logins and like from opportunities and the events, but that all instantly gets sucked away into whenever I realize, oh, I want to get like two hours closer to Exumers 5 or something. Like, it's a nice thought that your alliance can instantly skill into some new some new thing, but I think players are going to manage their SP even worse than they manage their ISK. I think I that's a feel that myself. Uh, if now if all my characters shared one SP pool, then that would really be nice. I feel like I feel like you guys have zero self control when you see SP now. <laughs> For me, I just get bored with it, and I'm like, nah, dude, I'll just wait. And then like when a new ship comes out, I can train it right away. But no, I, some people are like that. Some people want it right away. They want that instant gratification. Or maybe they always have a use for it. Like some players, like especially veterans, when you have enough SP, you're not dying to get skill points. So they just, they're able to save it. But this will be really helpful now for, for players who may not, you know, they're taking a break or they may not know exactly what they want to train. At least under the current system with attributes, I know a lot of people revamp their points to just two of the highest and then or leave rest of them to like the minimum and what they do is they use unlock allocated skill points to those skills that has main and sub attributes to those uh, skill points with zero skill points to start with so zero attributes to start with so that way it's much more efficient let's say to put those skill points in and to train those skills with the higher attributes yeah for sure and then, so attributes going away, but CCP also said rebalancing of all skills. So I'm hopeful that they revamp the Magic 14, either get rid of them or make it more meaningful when players train it. So rather than saying, hey, dude, train this 14 day skill for like to be able to just like use other ships more efficiently, it's more of a, I don't know, maybe they add a module to it or something along those lines or make it more impactful. But hopefully, I mean, I'm excited for that too, the rebalancing of all skills. I don't know what that will look like, but maybe some of us will get lucky and get SP back or something. Yeah, I think definitely shortening some of the skills make it much better, at least for new players, to start with those Magic 14s and actually be able to complete them instead of watching your skill queue for like two weeks and nothing change. Uh, training some of the cap skills, I would say that's one of the most frustrating things. Just watch that number goes down and just nothing. It's, okay, that's I think that's another reason why people complain about JDC five. But yeah, that's another whole story. Yeah. I don't know, Araya, Artemis, you guys have any thoughts on the skills rebalancing of skills? Super excited! I think it's a positive change. That's my status quo for this fan fest. Yeah, it's a long time coming. I think it's a good change. Nice. That's good to hear. I'm glad. I'm glad we're all like in line agreement on something. Those, I think. I think we hit the majority of the big topics. I don't know. There are some other ones. I know 
trying to think, what was it? CCP said there was an update tomorrow. So there was the Siege Green update is coming out tomorrow. So for those who have been following that, you can you can check tomorrow for the update in the patch. They covered a lot of like other little things, maybe not directly gameplay content wise, but more of like a philosophical direction of the game and like in the company. I don't know, Artemis, do you have any thoughts of where we should head to next? We haven't talked a lot about the cruel but fair sort of pillar they have and they're what to look forward to. The three highlights they have here are the Eve X XL, which I'm super pumped for as an XL lover, and then high sec griefing and anti cheat improvements. The anti-cheat improvements I think we can just quickly mention as something we've discussed multiple times during the show already, from nice null sec cloaky camper botters to null sec ratting botters to faction warfare botters, like that is a huge thing on the player's mind, and I'm glad that CCP mentioned it here as a priority for them, even though for security reasons like they aren't gonna be publishing what they changed there. Yeah, hundred percent agree. I think I know with the Doctor Who crossover event, everyone's kind of memeing about the Eve Excel crossover, or whatever you, you would like to call it. It's good that CCP is adding that. I think every Eve player uses an Excel spreadsheet in some way, shape, or form. My only hope is that it's not just Excel, but also Google Sheets as well. I know many people use them interchangeably, but not everyone has, I don't know, what is it, Microsoft Office Pro or whatever, to get all of the, the official Microsoft programs like Excel. But I'm, I'm excited for that. I think that's good, especially for those because it talks about like fair access to data, too. So not just the big gurus building third party tools, but every, you know, like every individual player should be able to be able to get data and like be able to use that data. The one thing I like is the high sec. They'd say griefing. And I know a lot of play players have been getting upset at CCP for saying ganking. But I think this is more of like gre like this is focused more on like the harassment level where more like the harassment level where a player doesn't know what's happening you know they're in a new system they're trying out the tutorial they have no idea what's going on and then they die and uh, a lot of players are pretty upset and i think there's almost a unanimous consensus that like new players should not be being griefed they can get ganked that's fair you're flying through null sec with some cargo like that's on you buddy but if you're in high sec just trying to do like your new player experience tutorial you should not be dying and that or you should not be dying to players i should clarify you should not be dying to players but it's i i don't think that's very fair and i like ccp's direction of letting the game be as it is cruel and harsh but fair and i and i like that direction where they're specifically calling out griefing yeah and i love that they had the slide and talked about explicitly the difference between ganking and griefing and if I were to, to tinfoil hat the way they discussed it, it feels like to me they are going to extend the definition of griefing to like if you're ganking a retriever or a venture that's it's a cheap ship, you're not getting any worthwhile loot out of it, you're just killing them to kill them, that's griefing. Same thing with like maybe an empty T1 hauler. Those are the things that happen right now and it's considered, oh, we're just ganking or code anti-miners or safety, what have you. But they're gonna they're gonna raise the floor for what is considered a gank to is it valuable for you as the attacker? Are you getting a reward for the kill? Versus just there's no tangible benefit and it, it's only the the newer player or the player who is in that cheaper ship losing and having a bad time. Yeah, and it it talks too about like so it's, it shows the attacker and how the attacker what the attacker gets, but also the victim. So the main one is like has no means to react. I just I always think of that new player and like they don't know what they're doing and they're just flying around and they die and like they literally like they die in such a way that they don't know how they died. Like and I've seen this with like streamers when they first start Eve, they'll be flying around and then they die and they're like what happened. And like they don't even know how to register that they're dead. They're just like, I don't see my modules. Like they don't know that there's a wreck sitting next to them and stuff like that. And like that's what I think of when I think of being griefed is like you are just like so oblivious to the game. Like you're still in the tutorial. You have no idea what's going on, and you don't even know like how what ha how something happened, let alone how to prevent it from happening or how to avoid it sort of situation. And so I'm hoping CCP starts taking a harsher reaction to some of that. Like at least new bro griefing. I'm not. I think when you start getting into like older players like if somebody were to try and grief me in the game i think it gets a little more complicated but like new players especially i think are like the sacred like golden egg of like should be protected at all costs sort of situation you know i i have to admit when he started talking about this in the presentation i thought he was going to go with and we're going to make high sec no pvp green flag only 
<laughs> See, I, I would think that is fair, but if it wasn't like the rookie system. So the systems were like, if you get reported, like you're banned because you shouldn't be griefing there. But if CSB were to say, nope, if you're entering the system, you have to have you have to have safety green. You're not allowed to murder anyone. It's it's like a safe space. So Joe Schmo can go out there and mine like tritanium from the rocks to try and complete the career agent mission or whatever it may be. Like that, that is what I would hope for versus, you know, something that can be abused by veterans or abused by people. There was a concern brought up in chat of like, what if a new player is out in a venture, gas huffing and null? I'd like to point out the slide is explicitly high sec PVP. If a player goes into an area of space without Concord, they are accepting the risk for the higher reward. They're making a choice there. A player in high sec is in high sec. They are new to the game, they're exploring, they haven't opted in to any risk other than undocking their ship in what's supposed to be a safer area of the game. That's the distinction for griefing. You don't have to worry about not being able to kill gas huffers in their ventures. Come on. One thing though, it says high sec PvP. One thing I hope they address relatively soon is high sec vortex. Currently, is is for me that it just seems like a few corporations are just trying to get those solo kills in Cheetah Gates at perimeter for some nonsense for almost all of the Nozick alliances. I don't think that's what CCP intended to be for high sec Vortex. So maybe there are things can do. I mean, it does talk about high sec PP, but I don't think it's mentioned around here. So I hope that's one of the things that they will look at at some point. But yeah, uh, for... I feel... Go ahead. Yeah, so I, it's often said that Eve Online takes inspiration inspiration from Elite, and I I kind of wish they would take inspiration from Elite in this area because they have a nice system where it's a consolidated new player zone. It's not different zones based on your schools, and you're safe from PvP in that zone. But once you leave it, you can never come back. So it is this safe, protected zone where you can learn the game, and then when you feel like I'm you're ready, you can then leave it and join the rest of the universe. Yeah, I agree. I gotta be then, a hard no on that. Like, I think a big draw of EVE Online is you're being dropped into the same single shard universe as everyone else. It is great to to drop a new player and then be able to have the Magic School Bus come into your new player system and, and hand you a Seeing all of the veteran players out there in their big ships flying around living their lives is cool. We just need cruel but fair systems that ensure you're not going to get griefed while you're going through that new player experience. So I'm happy with them keeping the newer players integrated into the ecosystem of everybody else and just having good systems to protect them. Yeah, I feel like you either have to have one or the other. We either have to have good systems in the current space to prevent new players from getting griefed, or you have to... I mean, if you can't do that, then you got to give them a space where they can at least do the tutorial without dying to a player. I, I, you don't need both, but you need like one or the other, in my opinion. And then with when it comes to war decks, I, I think CCP has been iterating on war decks, so I'm, I'm excited for that. So hopefully, Shen, they continue to do that, so then that way they can address some of your concerns too. Because yeah, there are. I feel like war decks are still exploited in a way. Yeah, I think other than this, what well, I don't think we have to talk about the. Uh new art designs for the hangar and all that stuff yet, right? I yeah, don't there think was we a talked about art. art. Yeah, we haven't talked about art yet. I'm watching Artemis attempt to find it. There's what I've seen. It's a lot of good art. We already saw like skins and stuff. They're changing the way uh, ship hangers look and like how how your ship looks within the hangar and making it more immersive, like it's actually your home and your space. They're starting that off with citadels and structures. They also had, I know you're flipping through it heckin' fast. They had a trailer, um, a new trailer, which I know had to do with a Kaldari. But yeah, CCB, the art team, I feel like the art team, no matter what happens in EVE, the art team always gets a big 10 out of 10. Yeah, so there's the trailer. Yeah, one thing I do like about like the new thing it's like it, it there's a difference between when you dock in let's say a staging system than just a random corner of of your space all right you do have the feeling that everyone's around you and you, you do see that from the guest list uh, inside the citadel but i feel like with those ships yeah you're seeing around you 
it can be much feel safer in some way. Uh, but also, I think it's a chance for people to show off their skins for some of the, their big ships uh, that they can just AFK in. Yeah, for sure. I was I kind of like that where you could see all your ships in the hangars, and then you, like you could see like the last ap applied skin. That would be super cool. Yeah, I just hope they don't take up too much time to undock and other stuff. I just hope the like, functionality just stays the same, make it cooler. I feel like that's all. That's all that that can be done. Yeah, there is a lot of time. What they do is there's that 10 second session change timer. So they just add, they're like, how do we make 10 seconds seem less like 10 seconds? And they're like, let's slap some art on it. And so I feel like that's where they're going with this, which is exciting. I'm excited for it. I might be one of those people who's like bitter and I'll just like turn it off or something like that. But I'm still excited for it nonetheless. I'm so upset that I can't find the all of the images they had for the docking and undocking and stuff. It was in Aurora. I think it's a. And it was a hanger. Yeah, it's a triangle team. I don't know what's their name called, but their logo is the triangle. Uh, tri -lambda. Yeah, yeah, that one. We'll keep looking for it, but it was it was really cool. One thing that Matterall noted in in our in our back end chat here is that they are getting rid of DirectX nine, and it'll soon be going to DirectX twelve. Yeah, that's one of those like updates that sounds cool, but literally no one's like, yes, dude, DirectX 12, finally, or whatever. Maybe one or two people will, but like not the entire game, definitely. No. It's like, I finally, I have to update my video card. <laughs> yeah. Even's even been interesting, though. It feels like the past couple years with all these graphic updates, you're actually having to get a decent graphics card if you want to look at it in all of its beauty. Oh yeah, dude, look at that. Like that looks so cool. Yeah, see, that's gonna take some time <laughs> to just talk up. I mean, to granted, I'm the person who sits there and clicks dock for twenty seconds straight till my ship actually docks. It's really frustrating, but like this would be maybe a good distraction for me. Well, I mean the the inventory and everything is up there, so it seems like this is just an animation that's playing and not necessarily locking you to preventing actions. Although there is the the session change timer, which they do have to fill that time. Yeah, also, session change is different from undock because undock, if your session change are done, undock is just instant, in theory. Well, if without lags, but docking can take some time. It's also yeah, worth noting sure. uh, high-res nebulas are coming in July, and they're also working on updating just other graphic stuff. So the graphics engine making Eve look very, very pretty is certainly coming along. Yeah, this is why this is why I always say the art team just kicks it out of the park, kicks it, hits it out of the park, knocks it out of the park, knocks it out of the park. You know what I mean? It's late. It's a Monday. But yeah, so like the art team, no matter what, CCP can be like, let's just throw the art team up there and they can always give us something like amazing. Yeah, so I always think the game's really pretty and I adore it. I feel like I've never gotten mad at art. I feel like this is the thing that we got promised the quickest, which is coming this June. Everything else is like fall q4 next year in a year of time maybe september 2023 but this is like june yeah that's like next month yeah well, well yeah because there's no there's no mystery to it like all of the other features and content and and toys as they mentioned that is coming sooner they are going to be discovering and releasing and trickling out through the arcs so like I, I feel like I have to keep reiterating this and reminding people the stuff you're, that's going to be coming out in the short term, you're not going to hear about at FanFest. You're not going to hear about it in a dev blog until it is very near to release and like hitting CC. You're going to discover those things through the story, through the arcs, through RP. Yeah, and a lot of those story arcs hit high sec, low sec, low sec. They're really centered around low sec as the high reward areas. It's, but if you're, if you're a null sec or even a Warhome player, not many arcs have hit those zones in terms of story updates. And that's, yeah. that's a good point, too, because I feel like Nullsec is also where players drive their story. So if CCP is going to drive a story anywhere, it better not be in Nullsec, right? Like they have all this content that they can do high sec. I mean, like high sec, low sec, and then even like Poshvin, 
in the Treglavian space where they can be driving the story that can impact players. But if you're going to focus on story, like CC, I will say CCP driven story, not player driven story. You do not want to be in null set because null set players are going to get really mad about that. Cause that's their space. Like they're like wild, wild west and, and whatnot. Well, Ash brings up a good point. Of, yeah. They were, he was prowling around Venal for an entire event with the Garistas event. And it seems like the current event, I haven't, somebody confirmed for me in chat, like the event sites are spawning in Nullsack. The way you contribute is whether you decide, am I helping, I forget the, the acronym for the new baddies, or you're helping Concord. Like it's, Smugglers? It's, yeah, the new smuggler people. It's who do you, whose sites do you run? Whose intel do you gather? Who do you pledge your allegiance to, if you will, by participating in their sites? That's the choice you're making, and it's by added event sites or exploration, that sort of thing, rather than a we're removing Stargates and shutting them down in Nullsec like we had with Invasions. The Deathless well, or Soro, thank you, Ashtarothi and Apex. Yeah, well, and I, I want to mention about that. If you go with the smuggler route, you actually take negative security standing, so be careful about that if you're worried about your security standing. I didn't realize that my choice had consequence. Oh no, uh, consequences of my actions. Sorry, Shin, what were you saying? Also, like, because if you have to choose two, so you only gain points from one of the sites, so maybe you can have to increase the amount of sites that spawns, especially the ones that maybe, like, spawns to, like, if, if you spawn in the same system, one Concord side, you should spawn like a smuggler side. So it like corresponds with uh, the sites themselves. It's just idea because this is the same thing as last August, I remember, with the uh, Mimitar event where you have to choose. Sometimes it's annoying to to choose, to, to have to have seen, like this is, there's plenty of sites, but if I run them, I don't get any points. So it's kind of sad to see that just go away. Yeah. All right, so costume when you pick sides is the big one. And I think somebody was saying, like, if you can get your settings reset, I think I saw that in another Discord, too, where saying, like, you can pick one side, and then if you switch, all your all your standings are reset, or all your progress is reset. Yeah, I can see that good for, like, a lot of veteran players who has a lot of time on their hand, I guess, to, let's say, grind one thing uh, all the way, and then switch, and then grind all the other, because you do get different sides of skins. Yeah. Uh, at least for this event, it's just the difference between which factions bl block up skins you get. Otherwise, everything else is almost the same. So maybe it would be also better if you can know what kind of rewards you're getting, what's the difference to begin with. So people can make a choice. Let's say I have skills for Redeemer. I want to get that skin instead of the Widow. So it would be better if you get more informed in the future. I do want to just quickly have a change in perspective. When we're saying about be cautious about your choices, it's it's not be cautious about your choices, it's your choices actually matter. Like, having you are deciding whether to go against Concord or whether to support Concord. Of course that's going to impact your security standings. And for all you new players out there, don't worry about tanking your sex status. It's not a problem, and if it ever becomes, like, if it hits the thresholds, I believe it's negative five, is when you're suspect effectively in high sec, anybody can shoot you. You can tag up and fix those standings just by paying in some isk. So while you're grounding, grinding all of these sites for Soros, or for Sora, Soka, the Deathless, while you're, while you're grinding the sites for the Deathless, just put aside some of that isk, and then you can buy some sec status tags, make some low sec farmers happy, and fix your standings afterwards. It's not a problem whatsoever, but your your choices have consequences, which is awesome to see. Yeah, but like I said, like I feel like if we can get more information, make a more informed choice, that'd be really good in the future to see the difference between rewards and what kind of consequences we will be having when we are making the choice. Yeah, I would like that. I really don't like things that affect my sex status when it comes to like trying to participate in events. But that's just me. I mean, ratting I positively affects your sex status. Yeah. Like, I don't want to rat. Is killing what anything in low sec impacts your sex status? Do you PvP sure. rain? I do PvP, and then I buy tags for it. Which is, like, that's the most frustrating thing to me, though, like with old faction warfare. It was like, if you picked a side you participate too much in that side, then suddenly you can't do anything else for a different side. 
And that's like, that's frustrating to me. But yeah, to, to get like, if you're below level five, to get all the way up to, from level eight to level five is 40 mil. It's, it's not an issue. You're going to make that in no time at all. So don't, don't stress about the security status. If anything, you're going to get to interact with new aspects of gameplay. You're going to make some people who hunt these clone soldiers out in low sec belt wrap. By the way, if you need to plex your account, this is a way you can do it. Back in the day before Abyssals, whenever I was in college and my account deplex, I would just take an Algos out to low sec and be hunting around in the asteroid belts for clone soldier rats and they would drop these tags. You'd also occasionally get the Mordu's rats and you'd get the Garistas, or sorry, the Mordu's Legion BPCs. Like, it's, it's a decent way to make ISK, and you're going to get some PvP on occasion while you're at it. Nice. I, wonder, I bet that's still viable now, too. I think Abyssals is, like, faster. You're just going to get like, way more ISK with Abyssals, but in terms of doing something where you also have the chance of PvP, it's a good option. Yeah, for sure. I know we are an hour and a half in the show. Was there anything else anyone to call out and touch on? I think we hit most of the big topics. The one part that I don't want to let drop are the structure balance updates even beyond Siege Green, which I honestly wish were dropping with Siege Green. Specifically, they mentioned that they want to ensure attacker commitment is the, the bullet point on the slide and when they were talking about it they mentioned having to anchor some sort of attacking structure that is valuable and so in order for somebody to reinforce a structure and with the intent to kill it they have to put some commitment there which i would love to see because then that means it is less likely people are just going to troll reinforce structures and you know if somebody's intending to kill off your stuff because that they've dropped this valuable structure that you can kill back if they no show I wish that was there for Siege Green to launch. It would make it a whole lot less hot garbage. Yeah, and I'm... There was something... Well, go on. There was something in the um, fan fest about the uh, multiple accounts that they're looking at maybe doing some benefits if you have multiple accounts in terms of pricing, but also it, it could be an incentive to get all your accounts under one email address. And they also listed a couple of things in that slide about security improvements. If you have two-factor authentication, and you ought to have two-factor authentication, right now you have to have a key for each one of your accounts, but they're looking at some sort of consolidation where you would everything's registered under one account, you have one key. I think that's really a really nice feature. One of the things we've spoke about in, in the past, uh, Matterall was a big proponent of it, was the CSM elections, how do you get down to one player, one vote sort of concepts? And it was very difficult because everyone has, who has multiple accounts has multiple accounts spread across email addresses. But if there's an incentive to get under one email address, it makes it easier for CCP to say, well, this is one person. They have five accounts all registered under this one email address. They get a financial discount for it. And then you open up the possibilities of doing things on a player basis, not an account basis. Yeah, that kind of addresses, I know there's a lot of talk about like CSM voting and whatnot where you can buy votes because people have accounts or whatever. So if you pay them, then they sub all their accounts and vote for you. So that would make a lot of sense for CCP. And I feel like it would also help get a better perspective of like who like who are actual players in their alts versus who's a player versus like, you know, an alt that isn't registered to them. Because I know some people don't put everything under one email. And then it becomes extremely difficult for CCP to gauge like metrics with their players. I also, I really like the multi-factor authentication improvements. I feel like CCP should strongly incentivize players to have multi-factor authentication on their accounts. And if you don't have it on your accounts already, for those in chat, make sure you actually do that. It will, it will greatly save you a ton of time later if you ever get hacked or have any issues with your account. All right, before we move on, I do have to throw my hat into the ring that I am not a fan of one player, one vote. All right, wormholers, they're, they're a small number of people. They need every advantage they can get to get their votes out there. I also feel like veteran players with extra accounts, you're investing more into the game. Your vote should have more weight. Yes, there are some potential downsides with vote purchasing, but I think on, on the scale of EVE, on the number of people who have two, three, four, five accounts, that impact on the voting is going to be way more than just a single person with 50 to 100 that they happen to sub to, in order to sell their votes. I, I don't think it's... 
worthwhile to get rid of the weighted voting that you have with four veteran players and four multi-boxing heavy players just to try and catch a few corner cases with vote buying. I think I can change your mind, Artemis. There was a slide that showed you which alliances has the most number of alts. So if I'm going to agree with you, not one player, one vote, I want one account per vote. Please support the Imperium with deciding the CSM ballot next year. No, I'm I'm completely fine with the the slide. I remember and I want to try and find it because it was a really cool graphic to have up. But I'm I'm totally cool with the Imperium if they're having a bunch of people with a bunch of alts, like cool. Awesome. Good work. You should have seats on the council. That's that's fine. Ash brings up a great point, though, with skill farms. There are some people with hundreds and a thousand plus accounts to their skill farming, and that's a hundreds and thousands of votes. But if they got yeah. a discount being tied to one email address, and that means they make a lot more money skill farming, that means they get one vote. So this idea where I can buy a thousand votes or 500 votes goes out the window pretty quickly. Yeah, that's it's all. I feel like this is a huge topic we could delve into once we start discussing CSM. What is it? CSM elections coming up? I think right now, if you are running for CSM, you can actually apply, and it's a couple days before CC, or I guess a few days before CCP, CCP gets back to you. Gonna make a forum post and all that, but we will not be discussing all that now. Just know that if you're running, you can go and do that already. Is there anything else folks would like to touch on? I know, Shen, you've been kind of quiet. One thing, though, is like, I remember there's a slide where to show the pre-DBS and then after DBS, where the each chart really shined, <laughs> after all. Like, every other shift fell dramatically, but the each chart stood up and high, and that's actually really true to what I'm seeing. Like, pre-DBS, I've seen a lot of gulas on a lot of things like that, but afterwards, it's just a lot of Ishtars out there. I think one thing, though, the uh, manufacturing change really changed the, the way that Gila's and Rattlesnakes react, uh, and, and also to a certain degree that Dominic's being used in OSEC, but Ishtar is a T2 ship, it's the least being affected out of all of those uh, blueprint changes that happened last April. Yeah, yeah I would... Go on. I would highly recommend if you are anti DBS or what's it called? The bounty risk multiplier BRM. Like, if you're not happy with the way that's impacted your gameplay, or you feel like the way that it's impacted the overall health of the economy, go and watch the data and the stats that people have been calling for four months. I, I find it hilarious that everybody was like, show us the data. The data in the MER shows that this is killing Eve. But then they have a whole presentation of just graph after graph after graph showing their point of how this has impacted the economy. And then it, it's radio silence. Nobody's like, oh, yeah, I was wrong. Go go and watch the presentation from the, the CCP data analysts. It's, it's really awesome. But yeah, the, the Ishtar, it only decreased about 10% in terms of the total amount of ISK that was generated by it between pre-DBS and post-DPS. But because everything else dropped by more, its percentage of how much it's earning is higher. And as a person who has hunted ratters in the past, I am happy with this because Ishtars don't fight pre-aligned. They aren't carriers, they aren't supers. And they also can't fit warp core stabs anymore because they decrease your drone bandwidth. So this is more people out in space, more characters, quite literally, and they are easier to catch and kill than carriers and super carriers were. Yeah, and that's the difference between an Ishtar or a drone boat and another ship. You don't rat an Ishtar to make effectively if you're if you're focused on one account you're you're riding in something else i mean even a battle cruiser will make more money per hour than an ishtar you run an ishtar so you can not have to pay attention to your screen which helps people hunting because now you're hunting someone who might be semi afk and you know as a hunter you're like yeah you get the kill but that's why people use drone boats it's so that they can do something on another screen watch netflix do something else i think i've heard people go and do laundry while riding an Ishtar and they check the screen every 10 minutes. Yeah, uh, the thing with Ishtar is like, 
is really for veterans to AFK. It's not really for new players. It is a hack at the end of the day. You do have to have Galantic Cruiser to five in order to train that, and that is a long time, especially for new players. And also, you have a lot of drone skills, support skills to be set up for Ishtars. Uh, so, and it, the Ishtar survivability is actually much better, like in terms of PP compared to the Gila, I would say. Gila gets a new tile really quickly. And so it does have a really good DPS, but the Ishtar just has much more durability with both the ADC and sometimes the amount of drones that you can carry as well. I'm really curious as to why the Gila dropped off so much with the DBS. The so Gila doubled its price, essentially. Ah, so it wasn't the DBS yeah. per se, it's just the faction ship costs which are coming yeah. down soon. So the Rattlesnake and the Gila. Also, with the double amount of Moonmore happened a few months ago, I guess, at this point, the Ishtar dropped in price significantly also too, so... There should be a spike at the little end, so it's much cheaper to replace one, so that people are more incentive to just keep just buy another one, and it's less time to basically pay it back. Oh my word, Ash! I'm gonna I'm gonna trigger you, bud. It's not deceptive if it shows not your conclusion. Like it just, I don't. You're gonna have to provide some more information on how these these graphs are deceptive when they just imply that your conclusion is incorrect. Yeah, I don't want you can you can spend a lot of time going to the graphs. The, the main point I've seen a lot of people mention the graphs are sharing data. The conclusions people are drawing from them are not necessarily uh, cemented. I mean, you can conclude things one way, include things another way, and I think that's some of the problems I have with the graphs. Um, the graphs themselves just are, are de depiction of data, but it is it it leads people to go to conclusions that the data isn't really saying. I think that's where I have a problem with it. I think Ash might be saying that too. Yeah, I think the problem is that it's just there are more than one factors at work at this point. With the Gila, with the Rattlesnake, the Mineral with the Blueprint change really affected it. And there are a lot of things with, let's say, movement of alliances, especially with some of the stats that showed earlier, that a lot of different regional space changed a lot of, let's say, the pre-DPS and after DPS. Esoteria was in a completely different place because Tess used to live there and they used to do a lot of writing there. So they generated a lot of bounty. But afterwards, right now, RMC is not, let's say, as big as what Tess was at the time. So they don't generate as much ISK. So it doesn't really show what CCP is trying to say. It really, is there more than one factor that uh, does that work uh, in that sense? One of the things I like with the graphs is they did a, a series of graphs based on the attendees at FanFest. And if you're watching from home, you might think, well, I don't care about this. But I think it's something special for those who took the trip to Iceland. They went to FanFest and they presented, here's data about all of you that are in this room. And I thought that was a, a nice addition for like a, a FanFest that has like an on-premise um, audience. Yeah, I like that too. I don't know. I think it would probably be at the what, opening ceremony. Yeah, also, I kind of like how the Nynx ratted a lot more than the Hell. <laughs> it just showed the, how popular the Nynx, is, the Nynx is. Yeah. The only other thing... Mm, did you guys have any other thoughts? Uh, I'm looking through. I'm just watching Artemis click through this stuff. Do you guys have any other thoughts on FanFest, things we may have missed? There are also some fantastic graphs on like just how broken and absurd the Roracle was in Super Capital production, which I'm not going to scrub through and try and find because I have a feeling we're just going to argue about that as well. But I highly recommend just go in and watch the presentation with the data and make your conclusions based off of data instead of your one anecdote, please. Uh, this is a good point. I think CCP spent too much time talking about this. This is a, a dead horse that's been beaten multiple times to talk about why we went to scarcity. And I think in, in the year of 2022, we're well past that. And that's actually one of the, the things I did not like about the keynote. The first 55 minutes were about the past. It was, I think it was just a little bit too much about this is what we did because we saw this years ago when we made the scarcity and we changed oracles. And we've had so many of these presentations from CCP, it would just felt like they're just repeating themselves. Maybe you could make the argument that it's too late, but 
I distinctly remember in every single like Dunk Dinkle article and when all of the conversation about the changes were happening, players were crying for show us the data, all we have is the MER. You are not showing us the data because the data would prove you wrong. Like this is this is certainly stuff you would have liked to have seen sooner, but they can't show data about changes over time unless the time has passed yet. And FanFest presentations, opening ceremonies have always been sort of a celebration of what players have gone through and the challenges they've faced and what they've overcome and accomplished in spite of them. So I think it generally fits with the theme. As long as the graphs are new, that graph is an old graph, though. so I've seen it before. So I, I guess that, that, that bothers me when you're, they were bringing back graphs they presented previously. And I, I, you spent a lot of time talking about things we spent a lot of time talking about, you know. I do appreciate some history, though. I think the keynote should have a past, present, future um, aspects to it. I just wanted a little bit more at the present and future. It was just it was overly past, and then at the very end, we jumped into what the future is. And I I agree with that sentiment. I just know it's been well, it's four years since CCP has done a fan fest keynote, so they were covering essentially three to four years. Which if they had done a fan fest every year, it becomes a lot shorter. So. I, as much as I don't like them talking about the past so much, I see why they did it, but just to kind of keep up with what they normally did. Is there anything else with FanFest you guys would like to discuss? It's worth mentioning as a PSA, if you attended FanFest and didn't get the pings yet, some people have tested positive for COVID, so please ensure you're getting yourself tested. CCP's put out resources for how you can do that if you are still in Iceland. Yes, and if you come home, please continue to get tested as well. I know some folks have had no symptoms and tested positive, so please try to stop the spread and do not t turn COVID or FanFest into a super spreader event where you're coming home and spreading it to people. Mask up, stay home, continue to get tested, and please stay safe. There was also another, I got shared this, this was four hours ago. There was an individual who used to be in Waffles in PL. His name was Regna Valder, I believe I pronounced but he was killed last Wednesday while fighting for the Ukrainian Foreign Legion overseas. So may he rest in peace. That was an Eve player who died, used to be Old Waffles in PL. I don't recognize the name despite being in PL, but I know so many people knew him. So another player we have lost, which is pretty disheartening. But like that's, I feel like we should be doing a sign of vigil or something maybe within the next week. I'm not sure who would be organizing that, but just somebody to keep in mind if players knew them. Any other thoughts? That was a couple real life, more somber stuff. But did you guys have any other thoughts from FanFest? After discussing, are you still all cautiously optimistic and then Artemis extremely optimistic? Yeah, well, excited for tomorrow, right? There's also downtime for Siege Green. All the blueprint changes are actually coming in. So all those capital production, you can see... It's going to spike some of the industrial indexes in some systems. It's going to go up really high tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, people, have been waiting. people have been waiting for this for a long time. I think right after the, that dev lock came out. Yeah, people have been waiting for this. It's like this Tuesday, this Tuesday, this Tuesday. Yeah, it's finally like this Tuesday. Yeah, so update tomorrow. Make sure you're paying attention to that, especially if you're in industry or have medium structures because those are all impacted. Yeah, also expect longer downtime than normal, I would say. I mean, we did get a long one last Wednesday, so maybe it's not going to be as bad, I would say, as other patches, but it's a big patch, so be careful with the time. Any final thoughts from you, Araya? No, I still remain cautiously optimistic. I'm really excited about the changes that are going in tomorrow. A lot of people are talking about industry changes and beam structures are going to die. <laughs> Yeah. Artemis, what about you? Any thoughts? My medium structures are already dead, so I'm just going to enjoy the new event. Well, I, I'm, I don't have any structures to be concerned about, but I will be doing the new event. I'm excited for it. I'm probably going to go out and do some exploration. But that was FanFest. Kind of sad I didn't get to make it, but we all got to watch from home, and there's some new and exciting stuff coming. You can be a bit of it, or you can be cautiously optimistic or fully optimistic. But ideally, we can see some of this stuff coming in the next couple months to a year. And then we can also hold CCP accountable when they don't deliver factual warfare like they promise. So that is what I'm going to do. 
but exciting stuff. Stay tuned. We should be starting to discuss CSM. So if you're applying for CSM, someone said in chat, you have until the 16th to submit your application. Make sure you do that if you're interested, even just a little bit. And we're, I know Ashtarathi also in chat will be doing interviews and then we'll, we will probably be discussing it here as part of Talking in Stations. But with that, I'll send you guys off and I'll see you all on Sunday. Bye. Guys, wave at the camera.